All right, um, so my name is Angie Strathman. I'm the Reader's Advisory Librarian here. And so today I'm going to be talking about a few of um, some recent books. All of these books are in our new fiction and a teaser for some forthcoming books at the end. Um, all of the books that I've chosen are either available right now for you to check out or have a pretty short holds list. Um, there's only a couple that still have some holds. I've also featured a variety of books from all sorts of genres, including nonfiction. So if I start to talk about one you're not interested, know that we're going to have another thriller or a mystery or a romance coming up um, too. So we'll go ahead and get started because I have a lot of fun titles I'm excited to share with you. And the first one is one of my favorite authors, Kevin Wilson. Uh, the Edge is a shanty town filled with gold seekers. We are the new fugitives, and the law is skinny with hunger for us. Uh, you might wonder what those lines mean. They are not the first lines of Now is Not the Time to Panic, but they are its beating heart and its origin story. The story is about Zeke and Frankie. They are two teenagers. They are both outsiders in their small town, but they strike up a friendship and then a creative partnership. Zeke is an artist and Frankie is a writer and they combine forces to create something and they put it out in the world and it soon takes on a life of its own and Zeke and Frankie, their friendship and their town maybe even part of the world, is never going to be the same after. This is a really beautiful novel about the awkwardness of adolescence, about um, creativity, about um, tentatively finding your voice and your power and putting it out into the world and just to see what happens. Um, just like every Kevin Wilson novel, it's full of quirky and flawed and very human characters, but lots and lots of humor and heart and even hope. This novel also has a really wonderful origin story. So I highly recommend that you find out, read an interview with Wilson after you read the book and find out where those first lines actually came from. Next, we have some science fiction uh, with a dash of mystery. Uh, we have The Spare Man by R Mary Robinette Cole. Uh, Tesla is a wealthy heiress and inventor, so think an Elon Musk type, and she's trying to stay unrecognized while she's on an interplanetary space liner for her honeymoon. But her hopes for anonymity are dashed when there's a murder on board this interplanetary space liner, and her husband is considered the suspect. So it's up to Tesla then to solve the crime and exonerate her husband. And this is an updating of the movie, The Thin Man, set in space. Um, so you'll recognize like the mystery aspects along with the science fiction ones, along with the kind of witty banter that the original is known for. Um, this one also has, uh, Tesla is a very complex character. She has wealth and status and privilege, but she also suffers from PTSD and chronic pain. And so um, the novel also kind of explores that intersection between privilege and disability. Um, so in addition to the uh, delightful banter, um, this one also has an adorable service dog named Gimlet. Uh, so if you like uh, fun animal characters, you'll like that, as well as some cocktail recipes included at the beginning of each chapter that you might want to um, make while you're reading this one. And uh, Mary Robinette Cowell won the Hugo and Nebula Award for her book, The Calculating Stars, which was a fun uh, mashup of historical fiction and science fiction. And so this one kind of does the same except for mystery and science fiction. And both are good for uh, science fiction readers and those who don't think they'd like science fiction, you may want to give it a try. Next, we have Jackal by Erin E. Adams. Um, Aaron, nothing much happens in Johnston. Uh, it is home of the world's deepest vehicular inclined plane. And so uh, 
you know, when that's your claim to fame, it, it's pr pretty much a, a small town where not a lot happens. Um, but for our main character, Liz, something very awful did happen during her childhood, which is why she's only reluctantly returning to her hometown for a friend's wedding. While she's there, um, she's watching her goddaughter, Caroline, and while she has her back turned, Caroline disappears. And this reminds Liz of another Black man, or, or of another Black girl who went missing, a childhood friend. Um, and so as Liz searches for her, um, for her goddaughter, she also searches the town's history and she discovers that there's an unsettling pattern in her hometown. Every summer solstice, young black girls go missing uh, and many of them disappeared in the woods uh, where Caroline disappeared as well. So what evil lurks there? It might be something mysterious or monstrous or maybe uh, some of the social uh, issues like racism that occur in the town as well. This is an intriguing mix of mystery and thriller, horror and social commentary. Um, it's about the disparities and attention paid when black girls and white girls go missing. And it's also about the many monsters that may be lurking in small towns, some that may be out in the open and some that may be buried away. If you like uh, Stephen Graham Jones's horror novels or even Jordan Peele's horror films that have some social commentary mixed in, you might like this one, as well as fans of Zelaya, Zelaya Delilah Harris's The Other Black Girl and Alyssa Cole's When No One Is Watching. And again, that supernatural thriller horror hybrid, you might like um, fans of Simone St. James or Jennifer McMahon might also be interested in this one. Uh, and Beth, we have a question in this chat about the availability of Spearman and ebook. Would you be able to check and get an answer for that for um, our attendee? Oh, got to un unmute myself here. It does look like it. We have it um, in both uh, the print and ebook, and large print is on order on that one. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, thank you for checking on that for us. Um, all right. Uh, so we are moving on to a very different uh, kind of book. We have some romance up next for you. Um, Samantha Young's A Cosmic Kind of Love is a romance written in the stars or maybe recorded in them. Hallie Goodman is an event planner, and one of her bride clients, Darcy, accidentally sends her a set of very personal videos, videos that her ex, an astronaut named Christopher Ortiz, recorded for Darcy while he was in orbit in the International Space Station. So as Hallie watches the videos, she finds Christopher to be smart and funny and charming and a little out of this world. So she starts to send messages back, but there's no harm in that since her emails keep bouncing and he'll never receive them. Except NASA's IT department uh, recovers them and forwards them on to Christopher, who is now reacclimating to life on Earth. So when he and Hallie meet in real life, can they sustain their cosmic connection? Um, you'll have to read this one to find out. Um, next, we have uh, more horror. Carrie is an urban indigenous woman who hangs out at the White Horse Bar. She reads lots and lots of Stephen King, and she also has a constant heavy metal soundtrack um, going in her car and, and in the background wherever she is. She is given a bracelet that was originally her mother's, and her mother had disappeared shortly after she was born. And when she has this bracelet, she begins having visions of her mother, and she may have unleashed more than she bargained for. So Carrie begins a search for the secrets of her mother, um, which also includes the secrets of her ancestral and family history, which lays bare the trauma that has unfolded among both her family and her community. This is a haunting horror novel that features a strong and tough heroine, uh, lots of pop cultural references. Um, fellow Indigenous horror writer Stephen Graham Jones says, 
It's metal to the end. It's Denver to the core. It's native without trying. They're ghosts, they're blood, they're roller coasters, and they're about a thousand cigarettes smoked. What else can you ask for in a novel? Indeed. All right, um, next we have Taylor Morris, Firestorm. And if you are a fan of um, CJ Box or Jack Carr, then this one is for you. This is the second book in the Garrett Cole series uh, after the first book, Downrange. Garrett is a DEA social, a special agent. He took down a cartel with the Texas Rangers in the first book. Uh, but this installment has him setting his sights on an energy consortium with possible international ties. And he also is um, in charge of a rescue of a CIA agent who was kidnapped by mercenaries. So there's lots of action in this one. So if you're a fan of action-packed thrillers with a really strong sense of place, um, so again, writers like C.J. Box or Paul DeWarren, um, who's Mike's About It series, will want to give more a try. Um, also, if you like former military characters, um, Garrett Cole is a former Green, Green Beret. And so the international settings, the connection to government, government organizations, this might also appeal to readers of Brad Taylor or Jack Carr or even Mark Graney as well. Um, sticking in the mystery suspense realm, but with a very different tone, we have Lavender House by Love A.C. Rosen. Um, at the beginning of this book, Evander Mills is having a pretty awful day. He's just been fired from his job as a San Francisco police detective after he's been caught in a gay club, which in 1952 in San Francisco, when this takes place, was very fraught with risk. But he's given a new life and a new case when he is hired to investigate the suspicious death of a soap matriarch of a soap empire, Irene LaMontagne, who was found dead at the bottom of the stairs. And Evander is the perfect man for the job because the family is housing not just possibly a murderer, but another secret too. The estate where the family lives is home to a queer found family. So inside the walls, Evander finds refuge. He finds a family that has the freedom to be themselves and to love openly. But just as in any family, especially a wealthy one like the La Montaigne's, there is also jealousy and secrets and grudges and resentments and among them many possible motives for, mur for murder. This locked room mystery is rich in 1950s San Francisco queer culture. Uh, and I really especially love the found family dynamic of this one, where a group of people are able to make a place and a refuge for themselves in a world that is often hostile to them. It's being described as knives out with a queer twist, which is a pretty apt description. Um, the mystery itself, again, is it especially twisty and clever, although it is enjoyable, and I didn't guess the ending. Um, but like Evander, you'll be fascinated to spend some time with the La Montaigne's. As a librarian, I couldn't resist including the band bookshop of Maggie Banks by Shauna Robinson. Uh, this delightful book begins... It took three statues to plant doubt in my mind. Those three statues are of Bell River hero, Edward Bell, a writer whose legacy hangs over the town, not just in the form of those three statues, but also its statutes or how the town is run and its laws. Um, Maggie has come to Bell River to help her um, run her pregnant friend's bookstore and finds that the town's historical society dictates that only classic books can be sold at this bookshop in keeping with the prestigious Bell's reputation. But Mackie discovers a community of readers who are longing to find books of their own and not just the ones that the town deems acceptable for them. I don't know, maybe as a reader, you can relate to that. 
Uh, so a underground literary community is in, is formed with readers meeting and exchanging and discussing the books that speak to them. So if you like the quirky small town setting where everyone is in each other's business, will appeal to fans who um, like the sitcom Gilmore Girls. Uh, and also the community that Maggie discovers will um, also appeal to readers who liked um, some other bookish novels like um, The Bookish Life of Nina Hill by Abby Waxman, The Last Chance Library by Freya Sampson, The Story Life of A.J. Fickery by Gabrielle Zevin, or Jenny Colgan's bookshop novels. All right. Um, we have some more romance for you. Um, this one is A Dash of Salt and Pepper by Kosoko Jackson. And I was absolutely charmed by Jackson's romance debut, I'm So Not Over You. Um, so this one has a culinary bent. Xavier isn't exactly thrilled to be back in his hometown after a breakup and a business failure. And he doesn't plan to stay very long which means romance is probably not in the cards for him until he meets Logan, who is a grumpy single dad of a tween daughter who is trying to run a restaurant. He hires Xavier as a sous chef, and despite their differences, the two start to build some serious culinary chemistry and heat. But again, Xavier doesn't plan to stay, and Logan is slow to extend his trust. Can the two end up finding their own recipe for romance? Uh, foodie romances have been really hot of late with lots of romances set in restaurants and cooking competition shows. So for those of you who can't get enough foodie flirtation, or those of you who like the grumpy sunshine romance trope, uh, will probably find this one equally delicious. All right, um, we haven't forgotten you historical fiction fans. Um, so we have The Lindbergh Nanny by Mariah Fredericks. Uh, it is one of the most famous kidnappings in history, the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh Jr., son of the famous aviator in 1932. The case dominated the news with suspicions falling in many directions. One of the most prominent targets was Betty Gow, the Scottish immigrant who had been nanny to little Charles, hired several months before. With a household in an uproar and fingers pointing everywhere, it's up to Betty to tell her own story and to clear her own name. Fredericks reaves in details from the historical record, along with her own fictional speculations, and this novel for fans of biographical historical fiction and historical crimes. Um, and we do have a question in the chat about recommending any so-called fan books, uh, which is probably in reference to the previous um, book that I talked about. Um, and where to find a list of them. Um, and I know that we have on our um, MCPL fiction account, a list of previous um, band books from previous years. Um, and I wonder if Beth might be able to pull up either one of those or like a list from ALA. If not, we can send it in the follow-up email. Um, I will see what I can find. Okay. All right. Um, so next we have Secret Lives by Mark DeCastreek. Your new retirement plan, if recent popular culture like the Thursday Murder Club series, Deanna Rayborn's Killers of a Certain Age, or the TV show Only Murders in the Building is any indication. Uh, your retirement plan might involve some amateur sleuthing, uh, such as the case of S Ethel Crestwater, our main character in this book. She is the 75-year-old owner of a boarding house for government agents. When one of her boarders is murdered and various government agencies seemed more concerned with the jurisdiction involved than actually solving the case, she teams up with Jesse, a distant relative, to figure things out for herself. And it turns out that Ethel is no amateur 
She has some serious skills of her own, not to mention the advantage that no one really takes her seriously uh, because of her age. The ensuing investigation takes Ethel and Jesse into the world of cryptocurrency and the dark web and cybercrime. Um, I know the Thursday Murder Club series is super popular. This one is definitely less cozy than that one, but if you would like to jump on the recent trend, you might want to give this one a try. Um, and again, we haven't forgotten nonfiction readers too. Um, Breathless by David Quammen um, was a recent book all about the COVID pandemic. Um, Quammen is one of the country's biggest science journalists, and he tackles the defining science story of our time, uh, COVID. He is the author of the National Book Award finalist Spillover about animal diseases that involve, evolve into human ones. So he is the perfect uh, person to write this particular book. In Breathless, he includes interviews with over 100 leading scientists and virologists. He explores why we were ripe for a pandemic, what we know about the virus, and the race to come up with a vaccine. All right. Next, we have The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by Megan Bannon. Uh, Megan is actually a Kansas City writer and a former librarian herself. Uh, this one begins, it was always a gamble dropping off a body at Birdsall and Son Undertakers, but this morning the Bride of Fortune favored Hart Ralston. Hart is a marshal patrolling the wilds of Tarnia, and he rounds up zombie-like creatures called drudges uh, for his job. That puts him in frequent contact with Mercy, who is trying to keep her family's undertaking business afloat um, and also coping with her father's failing health. So the two are often thrown together due to their jobs, but they also antagonize each other an awful lot too. Hart is also very lonely, and so one day he writes out his feelings in a letter addressed only to a friend. That letter gets delivered to Mercy through a delightful talking animal mailman that are in this novel, and the two start up a secret correspondence. This one is a little you've got mail, only there are talking animals and zombies and reflections on mortality and quirky world building too. It fills a lot of romance tropes. There are enemies to lovers storyline, a grumpy sunshine one, and it also features an important secondary romance too. Uh, Megan is a former Johnson County Public Library uh, librarian uh, and uh, full disclosure, one of my library school classmates. Um, and so again, if you wanna read a local author and this book was also recently recognized by the American Library Association, uh, one of their committees as the best romance of 2022. Um, a different, very different kind of romance uh, next is um, a historical one. Um, Never Rescue a Rogue by Virginia Heath. Uh, Virginia Heath was one of last year's romance genre con authors, and she delighted the audience with her wit and storytelling. Her latest is an enemies to lovers romance that has a duke hoping to bury the secret of his parentage. And he teams up with his frenemy, Diana, who is a newspaper writer who specializes in exposing the secrets of high society. So those who liked the Lady Whistledown storyline from Bridgerton will be drawn to Diana's character, uh, as well as fans of witty banter and biting barbs, as this is full of them. And again, fans of the enemies to lovers trope will also delight in the development of the relationship between these two as they go from enemies to allies to soulmates. Uh, and again, if you're interested in romance, our romance genre con uh, writers or, or authors for 2023 were just recently announced. And yeah, this one is set in the Regency era, so it would be a Regency um, ro historical romance. Um, so similar to um, Bridgerton, a lot of um, Sarah McLean's books um, and other popular historical writers. 
Okay, um, now we have some science fiction up next, this one with some pop culture tie-ins as well. It is Self-Portrait with Nothing by Amy Poklotka. Pepper Rafferty has a pretty good life. She has two loving mothers, a good marriage. It's a pleasant but pretty unremarkable life. And there's a hole in it, though. Pepper was abandoned as an infant, and when she was 15, she discovered her birth mother's identity. Her birth mother is the reclusive artist Ula Frost, and she's very mysterious. She's an artist famous for the claims that her portraits are able to summon their doppelgangers from parallel universes. Um, so when her mother, Ula Frost, goes missing, she tries to do some research and to discover the secrets of her mother's past and possibly find where she is in the present. And that's when the plot really picks up and turns part thriller. This one is a really fun and interesting take on parallel universes. I love the idea that it's art that summons uh, the doppelgangers from other universes. And I also really like what the author does with that concept. Pepper is always imagining the what ifs. And one of her biggest speculations is imagining a world in which her mother doesn't leave her behind. Um, but it's also a way to explore some of her other insecurities and doubts too. Um, the multiverse is having a moment with the success of everything, everywhere, all at once. And so this one is a little bit that and a little bit Blake Crouch's uh, science fiction thrillers with uh, different tones from either. But I think fans of both might enjoy this one as well. All right. Next, we have Are You Sarah by S.G. Lolly. Um, so our psychological suspense thriller books, so books by writers like Ruth Weir and Paula Hawkins, they're known for their catchy hooks and twisty plots. Uh, but there's only so many, the husband, the wife, the neighbor, the friend isn't quite what they seem plots to go around. Uh, so this one has a slightly different um, twist to it. In this one, two girls named Sarah leave the same bar and they both um, call up a rideshare service and they mistakenly get into the wrong car. When after our protagonist Sarah goes to the wrong home first, she returns to her own place only to find the other Sarah dead on her doorstep. Which Sarah was the real intended target? Uh, you'll have to read this one to figure that one out. Uh, so my pick for favorite title of recent months is this one, None of This Would Have Happened If Prince Were Alive by Carolyn Prusa. So what wouldn't have happened to our frazzled but feisty main character, Ramona? Um, maybe she wouldn't have discovered that her husband has been cheating on her. Uh, maybe she wouldn't have to deal with quite so much with her overly demanding boss. And maybe she wouldn't have taken custodianship of the class guinea pig, Clarence Thomas. Uh, but could Prince have prevented the weather, a hurricane? Well, maybe Prince can't control the weather, but his music and Ramona's sense of humor can help her pull through these 48 hours where Ramona, her kids, a neighborhood teen, and the guinea pig are all trying to evacuate from a hurricane all while she's also kind of dealing with messages from her cheating husband and awful boss. This one is for fans of humorous fiction about motherhood, um, writers like Maria Simple, Lori Gelman, Allison Pearson, um, you would uh, might enjoy this one as well. And it came out fittingly on Prince's birthday last November 22nd. All right, next we have some fantasy. Sonia Dean's The Book Eaters opens with the passage, these days, Devin only bought three things from the shops, books, booze, and sensitive care skid cream. The books she ate, the booze kept her sane, and the lotion was for Kai, her son. Yep, you heard that right. The books are for eating in this particular fantasy novel. 
Devin is part of a secretive group of families of book eaters who digest books and absorb their contents. While the boys are fed adventurous tales of heroism, the girls consume only cautionary fairy tales and are treated as pawns to be traded among families to breed new children with book eating abilities. Devin's son Kai is born and turns out he's not a book eater, he's a mind eater, and he depends on brains and not books for sustenance. In order to protect her son, uh, she escapes. The book alternates between Devin's past life with the families and her current life on the run with Kai. Along the way, she must question the way she has been raised and discover new aspects of her identity and make some difficult choices in order to protect her child. The Book Eaters is a book that explores patriarchal power structures, the nature of womanhood, found families, and the power of information and just who gets to control it. All right. Next, we have one for fans of cozy mysteries. Kristen Brecker's Snapshot of New York Cozy series debut begins with Liv Spires introducing her love of photography, saying that um, it inspired her to jump into things she might otherwise have no business tackling. And one of those things is a murder investigation. Liv is an aspiring photographer and she's hired to accompany an established photographer at a hot New York City social event. The event goes awry when a billionaire is found dead and Regina, her fellow photographer, the suspect. Liz makes a really intriguing uh, amateur sleuth because as a photographer, she has a very observant nature and an eye for details, which serves her well when she begins to investigate. Um, and she also has the help of all the photographs that she took from the event, which might contain some clues to solving the mystery. This is a fun premise for a new series start. Unlike most cozy mysteries that have like rural and small town settings, this one is a slight departure being set in New York and it has a young professional main character. The cozy fans will still recognize the um, quirky secondary characters, including Liv's uh, very boisterous family and all the ancillary details about hobbies, in this case, photography. All right, um, we have some more nonfiction for you next. And some of the best nonfiction books are, are the ones that seem to be too strange to be true. This has to be fiction, right? And that's the case with this one. Bradley hopes the rebel in the kingdom has one such fantastic premise. An attempt to take down the North Korean regime, not by a government organization, but by one lone self-determined, self-trained individual, operative, and the organization he creates. Adrian Young was a Yale student when he first became interested in the atrocities happening in North Korea and had a desire to help. This desire led him first to China and helping asylum seekers to escape to increasingly more radical actions, trying to persuade North Korean officials and di diplomats to defect and drawing up plans for a government in exile, and eventually a direct raid on a North Korean embassy in Madrid. The latter action made him a fugitive, and he remains on the run today. This is a compelling true story that reads like a spy thriller written um, by Ben McIntyre, but it's all true. It comes out November 1st. Speaking of spy thrillers. Next, we have Judas 62 by um, Charles Cumming. Um, who is Judas 62? He is our protagonist, Lachlan Kite, the head of the spy organization Box 88, a secret agency so secret that the CIA doesn't know about it. The Judas list is a list of Russian enemies they are targeting for revenge killings. Kite ends up on the Judas list due to his work as a student in 1993 when he was escorting a scientist across the border into Ukraine. 
So Judas 62, I am um, alternates between both Kite's mission in 1993 and also the present day story where he ends up in a cat and mouse game with Russian agents in Dubai. So this one has dual timelines. It also has international locales. And you also get to see the development of Lachlan as a protagonist and how he's grown and mastered his craft as a spy in the intervening years. This is an excellent addition to the espionage canon. Cumming was a former MI6 um, recruit, so he brings that background and knowledge to bear in this series. Um, this one can also definitely be read as a standalone. All right. Um, so we all have Anywhere on the Run next by Wanda and Morris. Two sisters, Violet and Marigold, are both looking to escape their hometown of Jackson, Mississippi, for very different reasons. Um, after an act of violence, Violet runs away because she knows that as a Black woman, she is never going to find justice in the Jim Crow South. Her sister, Maricold, has been working on the Freedom Project in Mississippi, and um, she becomes pregnant, and that causes her to leave her hometown looking for um, a better life for her unborn child. Both of the women's circumstances are tied up with the lack of options and safety available to them uh, during that time period. But neither sister can truly leave the past or those who are on their trail behind. This is both an extremely personal story of two women fleeing from their troubles and also a larger story that doesn't shy away from the harsh realities of what life was like for Black women in the Jim Crow South. It's taut and intense, it's moving and gripping, and this historical thriller will appeal to readers of Attica Luck or Step Cha's Your House Will Pay. I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead to one more nonfiction book. Um, it is Jesse Hempel's The Family Outing. Um, this one begins, everyone has secrets. I exist because of two secrets. One acute and unusual belonging to my mother, and one common and culturally condemned belonging to my father. Her mother's secret regards her trauma over an encounter with a serial killer, and her father's secret is that he is gay, although he was closeted for a large part of his life. All the members of the Himpo family suffer under the silence and shame of secrets until they don't. One by one, family members begin to emerge and embrace their true selves. Jessie comes out as gay, her sister as bisexual, and her brother as trans transgender, in addition to the parents' secrets. Hempel interviews each of her family members to share their stories in this book about the dangers of shame and silence and the importance of healing and hope. All right. So all of these books are available right now, um, but I would like to give you a teaser of some books that are coming out in the next few months that I am particularly excited about. So these next few books are ones um, that are being published in February, March, or April. And so you'll have to place your holds, uh, but hopefully it's in time to get in early on the holds list um, before they start to grow once these books come out. Um, so the first one is Rebecca Mackay's I Have Some Questions for You. This one is about Bodhi, a film professor and podcaster who is returning to her uh, high school boarding school, Granby. And while she's there, she doesn't have super great memories of that time. She was kind of an outsider. She was bullied. Um, and her former roommate, Thalia, was murdered um, while she was there. And so going back as an adult, Bodhi wonders if the teenager she was, who was preoccupied with all of her own problems, missed some troubling clues about what might have happened to Thalia. Um, some of her students create a podcast about the case, uh, and so that also um, brings up further information and secrets. And um, Bodhi's personal life also veers all too uncomfortably close to some of Bodhi's questions about Thalia. The title, I Have Some Questions for You, refers to a figure from Bodhi's and Thalia's past, and the book's narrative is written to that individual. 
Um, but it could also be written to Bodhi herself because the real person those questions could in some ways are addressed are to her um, about the role she might have played in covering up what happened, about the ethics of true crime narratives, and about um, Me Too and cancel culture. And so this one was a lot of fun. It is fiction. Um, and it has, um, you know, it brings in lots of topical issues, uh, a little bit of mystery and suspense, as a lot of introspective and reflection too. Mackay is the author of the um, wonderful The Great Believers as well. I am currently reading another mystery, Symphony of Secrets by Brendan Slocum. His previous book, The Violin Conspiracy, was a mystery about a um, Black musician whose violin goes missing, um, but it was also about what it's like to be Black in the world of classical music. Um, the second one is also a mystery set in the world of classical music. Um, this one includes a mystery from the past about a famous uh, American composer, a fictional famous American composer, who may have stolen his compositions from a, a neurodivergent Black woman. Um, so it has both a present day storyline and a past day storyline um, to it. Um, another book I'm reading right now, um, The Symphony of Secrets comes out in April, as well as this one, You Can Make This Beautiful by Maggie Smith. It is a, a memoir by uh, the poet Maggie Smith, who you might know from her poem, Good Bones. Um, this is all about her divorce and finding some hope and healing after that. Um, and because M Maggie Smith is a poet, it's written in these very beautiful and poetic and lyrical vignettes. Um, which, and she also reflects a lot on when you're writing a memoir, um, what parts are being told and what parts are being left out. And so it has you equally curious about what's being left out as what she shares. Um, and that one is out in April. In March, we have a nonfiction book, Poverty by America by Matthew Desmond. Desmond won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, Evicted. Um, in this one, it's all about poverty, but instead of being about why people are poor and, and their circumstances, this is all about the people who are privileged and how um, all of the the laws and their tax codes and our banking systems and all of those things um, that give us and the middle class and the upper classes lots of advantages, we're doing that on the backs of poor people. And so uh, he uncovers like all of these different um, societal circumstances um, that lead to poverty in America. So it'll make, it'll make you a little bit uncomfortable as you're reading it, but hopefully very thought provoking and inspire you to some action as well. And then up next for me, I'm looking forward to Dennis Lahane's Small Mercies. This one is set in 1974 in Boston when the city was uh, facing lots of upheaval over desegregation and busing students. And the storyline involves uh, a daughter, a white daughter who's gone missing and the death of a black man and how those stories intertwine. And they, this one is coming out in April. All right, so those are just a few of the many, many, many wonderful books being published in the next few months uh, that will hopefully, one of those will catch your eye. Um, we will be doing another one of these program, to, we'll be doing these programs quarterly. So if you like this format, um, uh, you'll be able to uh, see uh, future books that I'm excited about. Um, and uh, if you fill out the survey that uh, Beth posted in chat, that will let me know what you'd like to see for future versions of this. Does anyone have any questions before I turn it over to um, Beth for some closing? Uh, let's see. Erica says, thank you so much. This was super fun, and I'm excited for more book recommendations in the future. Um, and it will be May 4th at 7, um, again on Zoom, the next one that Angie will be doing. Okay. Um, we've got a question. Do you recommend YouTube books for buzzworthy books? Yes. Um 
so YouTube, there are lots of, the wonderful thing about it is if you are a book lover, there are lots of different avenues and places where you can discover them. Um, so there's a whole side of YouTube called BookTube where you can get lots of people sharing their recommendations. Um, you can also find um, BookTok on TikTok um, and also Bookstagram for Instagram. Um, so lots of wonderful places um, that I enjoy finding out new books, but also don't um, visit your local library and talk to your librarians. They're also a great source too. Um, and we have great lists. You sold me even on genres I don't read. All right, that is great to hear. I would like to know, is anyone looking forward to what books that you're looking forward to reading? Um, not ones shared here, but ones that are on your list um, you're excited to read. So you're welcome to share those in the chat too. And while folks are doing that, I should also mention that the link um, to the list of books that Angie talked about tonight is in the chat and it will also be in an email that you'll get along with the link to the survey. Uh, okay, so a forensic genealogy investigative books. Um, the, there was a fascinating nonfiction book by Aaron Kimmerly, We Carry Their Bones, about the Dozier School for Bone or for Boys, that infamous school, and uncovering um, the secrets there. So that is a place to look for that. Uh, Dinosaurs, a novel, um, Lydia Millet, that one is on my list, and I am too, and very excited for Ann Patchett's new book this year. Miracle Creek by Angie Kim, The Missing American by Kwai Korty. I will start with The Missing American because I have read that one. Um, it is a mystery set in, oh, I am going to forget which country in Africa, so I will not mislead you. Um, and um, it is about a private detective um, in that country. It's really fun. Uh, it had a twisty mystery, and um, I loved all the details about Africa that came out in that. Uh, and The Miracle Creek by NG Kim is kind of a legal thriller um, that is about um, people suing a, a company. And it's also for fans of literary fiction and also for fans of legal thrillers. Uh, romantic Comedy by Curtis Sittenfeld. I'm also excited about that. I just also saw that Sittenfeld is coming to Kansas City on her book tour uh, in April um, in an event sponsored by Rainy Day Books. So look for that. And we have a fun romance, Kate Claiborne's Love Lettering. Uh, Martha Howe Kelly's fantastic historical fiction, The Golden Loves, uh, The Golden Doves. Um, yeah, so um, Erica, the um, romantic comedy, or Curtin Sunfeld is going to be at Unity Temple on the plaza. Um, also, Maggie Smith, um, the memoir that I shared, um, she's also going to be coming um, to Unity Temple. Um, both of those events, I believe, are in April. Yeah, they have new ownership. And so um, I, I just recently discovered they've been adding some new events. Um, so there's a few other ones that are going to be both um, at the Pla Kansas City Plaza Library and also at Unity Temple. So, All right. Well, um, thank you to everybody for coming this evening and to Angie for sharing all those wonderful titles with us. I know I added to my to be read and holds list this evening. Uh, I will also mention that um, this was recorded this evening and so um i'll send out the link uh it'll be on our youtube channel um once it gets edited and put up um to everybody so that you can go back and review as necessary and um if you know somebody who missed this evening um you can feel free to share the link with them as well all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Angie, and have a good night and stay warm.